Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you for joining me in another of my wonderful interviews. Today we're going to become a laser, I am told. We are going to have a look at some of the examples of, well, misconceptions of law. Have you thought about this? Uh, we've on this channel, I've had so many different people telling me different ways to approach things like council tax or speeding tickets or things like that, which are being perhaps unlawfully uh, targeted against us. Is this just a revenue stream for the government or is justice being done? And is the approach to pushing back against this uh, one way or many myriads of different ways? And do we need to understand um, our belief system? Well, the man to help me through this maze is, of course, Mark Horn from peacekeepers.org.uk. Had him on about oh, just under a year ago, um, had a marvellous conversation. And he joins me now. Mark, it's lovely to have you back. Hi, Richard. Nice to be back. It's been a while, as you say, but I've been very, very busy anyway. So. Uh <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, we met up in uh, Stroud oh, in oh, right. something like August, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it was nice to uh, to actually meet you and have a face-to-face a, a -face conversation. Absolutely. But, it's so different from the Zoom, isn't it? Oh, I know. We both do so much Zoom stuff. It's nice to yeah. get away and actually meet the real people. But Absolutely. We yeah. are back on Zoom with one another and we hope that the uh, the audience watching will uh, be uh, taken down an interesting path. I think we're going to have a fascinating conversation um, because I know that you, you want to bring people together and uh, this is a message that I have heard from so many different people on all sorts of um, the attack really against what's been happening to us on health and sovereignty and law and various things. Mm -hmm. But um, we do seem to be, and, and, and I think my channel has had so many different people who are fighting the same causes but from many different perspectives or or beliefs as you we yeah. were chatting just before we recorded and i know you want to sort of bring together that there are these misconceptions of mm -hmm. law so uh, this is very much for um, for you to help me out <laughs> to understand a, a, a proper excuse me a proper approach to dealing with some of the um, the harms that we're seeing legally yeah. uh, or lawfully. I mean, like I was saying, in essence, the problem, there's a number of problems. We're, we're a light bulb without a um, lampshade. And so we've got people pulling in all sorts of different directions with all their opinions. Mm. Um, and uh, that really is wasting energy. And uh, it's about trying to find the true cause. If we don't understand the problem, we can't, uh, um, you know, create a solution. Um, so, like I said before, the analogy I use, nobody actually knows what's going on. And in this, I include the judiciary, including up to the Supreme Court justices. Uh, so right from the bottom, from the lay magistrates all the way through. Um, they all have the same judicial oath. And so in law, they all have the same power. It doesn't matter if you are a, ma a lay magistrate or the uh, you know, head of the Supreme Court. The judicial oath is the same, and that's to law. But if people don't understand what law actually is, then how can they do their job properly? Mm. So uh, to do that, I've been down knew every rabbit hole, kicked off every group, because I'm very male-brained, uh, logic, and my background is more or less from when I finished university, I've been in contracting. In contracting, you have to find the errors in the contract to be able to go and be the cheapest bidder, to be able to get the job, and you need to know where the mistakes are so that you know how to load the contract uh, to uh, make a profit. Uh, so uh, really, it's about you need to search for the truth. And that's what's different with peacekeepers. We are, I mean, we knew in the game, so to speak, you've got lots of people with uh, age old conceptions, which have been tried over the years. And like I say, when I ask for evidence, there's two actual aspects. It's about facts as well as rationality, because law needs to be rational. Mm. Um, and so we're very, very uh, strict 
uh, with what we discuss uh, on the groups because it's a focus group where we've got a common purpose and the common purpose is to follow evidence and logic and reason. Uh, and so we get uh, a lot of stick for basically um, shutting down conversation, for instance, on straw man, Sester KV Trust. Uh, we've got topics which we basically say freedom of speech is not about attacking a personality. It's about challenging a person's belief and thought process. Uh, and so when people start off on personal attacks, which is quite common, uh, uh, David Shirolambis Shir very clearly explains it. It's, it's, it's a defense mechanism that we have because if somebody questions our belief, they actually are attacking us. Right. And so depending on how we react to that or how we approach something, we either can have a discussion in rationality or you just hit a brick wall and it's totally pointless to continue a discussion. Uh, and so, like I say, as a result of me questioning, I got kicked off uh, just about every uh, group you can think of. So uh, we're getting a lot of stick because we just shut down and get rid of uh, certain topics. People are very happy to discuss them elsewhere or come back when they've got evidence or rationality to support that belief. And we'll look at it because it's not about being right. It's about searching for the truth. Being right is about ego. Mm. Uh, and so by changing the outlook to the search for truth, this is our best understanding based upon the evidence and logic and reason at this point in time. When new knowledge or evidence comes about, we need to correct our belief system. So that is what we're trying to uh, achieve. So... Uh, through this, uh, it, it, a lot of myths, if you want to call them myths, are actually uh, exactly that, a waste of energy. Because the evidence shows that there either is no logical reason or most of the time, actually, it's a misunderstanding of what's actually being expressed or said. So uh, can I share my screen, Richard? Just I've got a few examples that I'd like to. Yes, uh, uh, yes. Um, share it away. I record separately from, um, so I'm screen grabbing. So I might just yeah. have to make a little adjustment. As yeah, we no do, worries. But, yeah. Um, so I have to, hang on, I've just got to give you permission to do that, which if I remember correctly is there. Okay, because all I want to do is show by example how mm. Uh, people with preconceived ideas who don't challenge their belief system based on the evidence is really a, a lot of a, a waste of time. So let me just find where I've got that. Uh, I'll just put it up there. Uh, I need... Just hang on. So what I want to do is go through a few... Uh, things which you hear very, very all over the internet. So the one is basically dog, what I call dog Latin, quantum grammar, the way, the name. Yeah. Okay. So this one here is in an employment tribunal and that there at the top is the guy's actual normal name. Okay. And he didn't like that and wanted it in small letters with dashes and commas in between. Okay. So they've said, okay, fine. If that's what you want to be known, how you want us to write your name, we'll do it. So they've written his name in the normal uh, manner in which it appears on the claim form to be known as then Michael Henry, uh, Michael Dash Henry, using lowercase type. So this shows you, and we've got numerous examples of this, including with two dots here and commas. Oh, yes, and yes. And all of this stuff. Okay, it's not in the name. Okay. And, and so really, uh, our, the capital letters, they call dog Latin, is of no relevance uh, and legalese. But that there's one uh, example of a, um, a, uh, a myth which mm. really is not supported in evidence. Another one is this thing about a dunce number. 
Yeah, and this is particularly relevant in council tax. You see a lot of this. People are saying that uh, a dunce number means it's a private for-profit corporate body. Okay. So this is from uh, Dunce's own website. Okay. And here it highlights what a dunce number is. And then it tells you the dunce number is assigned to all types of businesses, organizations, including sole proprietor, ships, corporations, partnerships, nonprofits, and government entities. Yet you've got people saying, because of a dunce number, it's a private for-profit business, and they'll include councils and courts just because they have dunce numbers, and they've not researched what a dunce number is actually about. They are making false claims and wasting people's energy by saying... Would, would you have a, a dunce number for a family-run business? You could do, because part, the main reason for dunce numbers is that you can, uh, 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 for credit checking, if you want to raise capital on US markets. Right. And and so a government would, I mean, I was just, um, and, and a government, what would be the reason a government, again, to raise money? Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, yes, they do use a birth certificate to raise money. And the reason is you can get, based on your ability to collect the tax, you uh, can get a discounted revenue today for a future tax uh, flow. Uh, this is very common business practice. So most people that own business when times are hard will have heard of what's called factoring. Mm. What you have is you'll sell, if you your business terms are say three months, you only get paid after three months. If you've got a cash flow shortage, you may discount your invoices and sell them at a 10% discount today so that you can uh, raise cash flow whilst the person that is purchasing your uh, invoice book uh, will get their money after three months. So uh, that there is based upon the ability to uh, um, collect your future revenue streams. So it's a very common business thing. So the mm. councils, they will be will be trying as the government to finance today's expenses on future revenue streams. So the councils, for instance, they've got a council tax revenue stream based on quarterly payments, for instance. They can discount that uh, based on their credit reference of which uh, Dun & Bradstreet will provide a credit reference so you can evaluate whether this is a risky uh, venture or not, as will do the government. But however, it's not evidence of a private for-profit corporation. So this is another example, like I say, of a, um, a myth where people are wasting energy thinking they've got the, you know, they've got the panacea and the courts have got dunce numbers and everybody's got dunce numbers. Therefore, government organizations or government entities, it makes it very clear here, government entities also have dunce numbers. Right. So they've got they've got a piece of the jigsaw, but the logic is taking them in the wrong direction. Yeah. 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 The, the, the important part of the jigsaw of dunce numbers is that the government based upon their ability to extract money from the people, can discount that revenue stream to finance their pensions today and keep things afloat today. Mm. So that there in itself is wrong. Uh, and that they should not be allowed. If I ran my business on a model like uh, governments and councils are, then forget it. I would be in jail because you know, it's unlawful, basically. Right. Okay. Um, so you've uh, you've eliminated that one. And I have to, I mean, I must uh, say that um, I have been saying that on the channel myself because I've had so many people that I've felt I've trusted with the Duns number, yeah. Duns and Bradstreet. And I'm only a YouTuber putting out my opinion. Um, but there's been a, a whole load of, um, you know, 
And you could say, well, Vobes, you should have done your due diligence. Uh, but I suppose no, to do that might to, take a long you, time to do. I think you're right. In what you're doing is you're allowing, allowing freedom of speech. I, right. People can put their opinions out. Okay? Yes. Um, so from that viewpoint, absolutely fantastic by giving freedom of speech for people to put their opinions out. However, um, once those people are with the knowledge that it's no longer correct, their belief system, that's when it starts to become uh, an issue of causing harm. Yes, and no, I, I totally get that. Yeah, and therefore, it's not about being right, which is ego. We need to accept when we have evidence which blows our belief system out the water. And we need to modify our belief system with the new knowledge we gain over time. At the time, parents do what they believe is best with the knowledge they have for their kids. It's only afterwards you realize damn, I knew nothing. Mm. Okay. And so it's about keeping up to date with the new evidence and modifying your belief system. So, so this, you've, hmm? yes, you've, sorry, I was just saying you've taken us on to legislation.gov.uk. Yeah. yeah, I try and always take people back to source documents uh, and give my interpretation. So this is another one, the Local Government Act 1888, where people only look at this one here in yellow. All duties and liabilities of the inhabitants of the county shall become, as uh, shall be duties and liabilities of the council of such county. Without understanding the context of this, what does this actually mean? Mm. Now, it, in uh, uh, on legislation.gov, you've got two options here on the left, what version? One is the latest available revised version, and one is the original as enacted. So in the latest available version, it's only got point two. So people are reading this, all duties and liabilities of the inhabitants, i.e. council tax, are the duties and liabilities of the councils. That's all they're reading. Right. However, when you go back, you need to understand what does this relate to? And section two relates to section one. Therefore, you need to go back to the original as enacted to get the context of the meaning of section two. So section one says the council of each county shall be body corporate by name of the county council with the addition of the name of the administrative county and shall have perpetual succession and a common seal and power to acquire land, uh, acquire and hold land for the purpose of their constitution without license in Mortmain. So what they are saying at this time, when this change occurred, any duties and liabilities of the inhabitants will be taken over by the new county council. It used to be duties and liabilities of the county but any existing ones move to the council. So again, the context of understanding uh, what it's about leads to a misrepresentation of uh, what's going on. So people basically think, oh, all duties and liabilities of the council, mm. I should not be paying council tax. So yeah, little knowledge can be dangerous. Uh, yeah, but again, going back to this principle, once you know that that's not correct, Yes. It's not about being right. It's about correcting the misinformation to reach a, a better understanding of the truth. Yeah. And then. No, just, absolutely. Just sort of uh, 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 moving on from there, really, okay, um, is uh, to just look at what is going on. So this is from the Human Rights Act 1998, part two, the first protocol, article one, it's called protection of property. So in the top half here, I've got the quote. And what it says is every natural or legal person is entitled to the peaceful enjoyment of his possessions. No one shall be deprived of his possessions except in, ah, oh, now we've got some exceptions as to private property ownership the public interest 
and subject to conditions provided for by law and by general principles of international law. And then it clearly tells you, the preceding provision shall not, however, in any way impair the right of a state to enforce such laws as it deems necessary to control and use property. Okay, so the government will tell you whether you can or can't enjoy your private property. In accordance with the general interest, i.e. mob rule, we'll get onto that in a minute. Mm. And specifically, they're telling you, or to secure the payment of taxes or other contributions or penalties. This is telling you without any, uh, you know, question, if you don't pay them what they want when they want, okay, they will take what they want when they want from whom they want. So it's got absolutely nothing about the court being run as a private court or about the name or about, uh, you know, Dun and Bradstreet numbers. They're telling you straight. If people can't accept this expressed word, mm. the Human Rights Act, that they're a bunch of thieves, no different from the mafia, okay? Uh, and they're trying to place themselves above the law. So, well, I suppose that's the thing, isn't it? People reading that will go, oh, uh, if that's the situation, then it's hopeless. Ah, uh, OK. But at least, <laughs> we've had, at least we've identified the true problem. Yes. And now we can concentrate our energies on sorting the problem. If we believe the problem is done in Bradstreet numbers or private courts or quantum grammar, we're all wasting our time. They've told you. You don't do what we want. We take what we want. Right. So at least we can start to focus the light into a laser. Mm. And the real problem is this one. And this here is uh, the, the way we can take direct action to actually do something about it. And, and this is where the peacekeepers are. We are trying to concentrate now that we've identified the problem and we can evidence it. OK, so this is the High Court judgment, OK, in Willock versus the Secretary of State. And this is From about, 2018. Yeah, very recent. Yeah. Okay? And so in Section 17, it tells you very clearly, it's unnecessary for me to cite from those judgments at length the following propositions. The next part is important drawn from the legislative provisions as construed by the courts, i.e. this is a construction of the courts, okay? In these cases are well known, uh, are now well established and uncontroversial. So in regards to council tax, the courts are accepting the power to commit is coercive. It is intended to be used to extract payment of debt from those who are able to pay not to punish the data okay so it uses the word debt however there is no debt and there's no evidence of a debt all that they're doing is following their statutory duty to check if a sum has become payable and has not been paid that is all the judges and magistrates are doing that there's what's called a statutory duty they have, and that there is an administrative task to ensure that those governing the agents of His Majesty's government, which includes the councils, are following the procedures. However, by granting a liability order, that there is where what's called unlawful conversion occurs. The government has actually defined whoever the court makes a liability order against as a debtor. It hasn't said that it's a debt. However, here you can see how the word association from debtor, which is a definition, it's merely a word, they believe a debt has been created. Yet, there is no evidence in law of a debt ever having existed. 
and the councils will tell you openly there's no need for contract there is no need for consent and so this here is the problem the intent of the local government act uh, 92 and the council tax admin and enforcement regulations 1992 is clear it's a land tax they know they can't screw money out of the land therefore how can they screw money out of it the people so they make the people liable for living on the land that there's directly in breach of their duties uh, in the bill of rights 1688 where they have a duty to keep your ancient rights and liberties protected our ancient rights and liberties are simple okay we have mm. a right to seek shelter from the environment we have a right to collect our water to heat our homes uh, to uh, have uh, air and grow our food so what they're doing with this is they are in breach of their duty and that means the king the uh, parliament uh, the government and its agents i.e the councils and the courts all three are tasked uh, all four sorry are tasked to uphold your ancient rights and liberties that there is a premise within the bill of rights which they are duty bound okay mm. so their judicial oath and like i've said before the judicial oath of a magistrate is no different from that of the highest uh, supreme court judge but they have the same power what a, a supreme court judge in law can do so can a magistrate However, with the administration, what they've done is separated things out that magistrates only have a statutory uh, authority to deal with certain matters. And then the uh, civil courts have authority going through different levels. However, in law, it's the same. Each of them makes the same oath to swear, yeah, they swear, that they will truly serve the monarch in the office of whatever the judicial office is. And I will do right to all manner of people after the laws. Okay. But As it says have, there on the screen. If you don't know what the laws are, how can you uphold your oath? You can't. Right. Okay. So it's a question of finding out what law actually is. So I don't know uh, if we've got time, uh, but uh, to, to get people starting to pull together, I really think we need to start talking a, a, a common language. Because when we talk about uh, law, uh, even common law, uh, again, people don't like it because I ask questions. So when I ask questions, what do you mean by common law? People get very aggravated and, uh, you know, I'm testing their belief system. Right. Uh, and so it, it's like different people have different understanding of what common law is. They have a different understanding of what precedent is. They have different understanding of, you know, so many things. So if there's any legalese creation of different meanings of words it's actually we the alternative community are actually creating legalese uh, to try and you know muddy the waters interpretations by the courts are simple this is law of the land okay which applies to everybody and therefore what does everybody have in common basically school leaving english so that there's what's called the test of reasonableness the courts will always ask you including with ta council tax have you got reasonable excuse why you did not pay the that there is important people understand that mm. what they're saying is have you got lawful excuse for not complying with the statute law so um, I don't know if we've got time, but if we've got like 15 minutes. Yeah, no, yeah, we've got time. 
um, I, I'd like to go through really the history um, of uh, um, terminology. Right. So that people can start to see uh, slight differences, but it's important that we actually start uh, to use the same language when we're talking about yes. certain things. Again, so, so, just to just to pause you there for a second, yeah. because I, I in the journey that I've been, yeah. people will have seen through the videos that people are saying, ah, they're using the Black Laws Dictionary <laughs> um, and, you know, we should be, and it's version four and not version 11, which is the current one. Um, or this means that understand means, you know, do you stand right. under and all of this sort of stuff, yeah. which of course is um, confusing for people yeah. because we're all using a, a common language like person when we are yeah. talking about an individual, but then you'll read in the Black Laws Dictionary, oh, but that also means incorporated person, etc. Uh, yeah, Black, that, that's a classic example. Okay, Generally, I've got three versions because I've been down all these rabbit holes. In all three virgin, versions, the first definition is a natural person. Uh, but people will go through the 40 or 50 different definitions where certain court cases have called them different things. Mm. That there's a specific so the Interpretations Act is what's called a general. So generally in an act, the word person means a, a, a body, it includes a body of persons in corporate or unincorporate. So that there's a general definition. Uh, whereas in certain acts, then it may have a more specific meaning, i.e. it may exclude natural people or it might exclude uh, um, corporate body corporates, incorporated people, and only be talking about natural people. So you'll see, and sometimes they'll use the word individual or, uh, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. But that okay. specific meaning gives the context within a specific act, whereas the Interpretations Act is a general meaning. Right. Okay. And fundamentally, again, it comes down what does a reasonable person or individual or man or woman or whatever you want to call it on the street understand by the word, i.e. a school leaver, what do they understand by the word person? That there is the general meaning in the Interpretations Act. Does that follow when you have things like the four corners rule and things right. in boxes well, and absolutely let's talk about the four corners rule okay um uh, here okay i've got my scrap notepad where i have lots of notes okay. yes and here i have some pieces of paper that i tore out of it today yep okay whatever is bound within this is within the four corners of this. The whole document is bound together. Yes. These scraps of paper are no longer part of this four corner. Right. Unless I've specifically referred to them within this. So again, going back to basics, okay? And if there's a box, and let's just see, uh, let me just see if the image of the... Um, uh, legislation has got some boxes on it okay yeah so let me just share this one again uh, okay so here there's a box called status oh yes here's a box called next provision there's another box called previous provision there's a box called latest available revised there's a box called original. Okay. Yeah. Are these boxes there? Can you see them or not? I can see them. Right. Therefore, they exist. Anybody that thinks that box doesn't exist needs their eyes testing. <laughs> However, what the four corner rule means is everything that you can see here, okay, within those four corners is included in here. This does not include the Local Government Finance Act 1992. 
it's not referred to in here. So the four corner rule is what is included within and bound together within the four corners. So here, which is quite typical and normal, boxes can be used to emphasize or draw attention. Uh, right. So they're not those things that are off the page and are not part of the, if they the, were, the doc. Absolutely. If they weren't part of this document, they wouldn't be putting it in. Right. Okay. It's just, uh, I mean, Absolutely. some of the things that you get as these demands from the enforcement agents and then right. people say, but it's not on the page because it's in a box. A little kid can tell you, I can see it, it's there. Yeah. Okay, but like I say, the concept of the four corner rule is, so for instance, if you look at the Bill of Rights, that's in the acceptance by the Crown, talks about the Coronation Oath Act. The Coronation Oath must be given. So you've got the Bill of Rights is one document, and... It, because it refers to the Coronation Oath, i.e. the Coronation Oath Act uh, 1689, that is a part of the Bill of Rights because it's directly referred to within it, even though it's a separate piece of paper and right. bound together. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. So, right, okay, I just so there was a couple of things that popped yeah, no, into my head. Yeah, this is what I'm yeah. saying. There are so many irrational things going out around uh, but once we start to understand them, then we can start to laser focus the energy on the true problem. Yes. And for that, we need to be talking the same language. If everybody is referring to the same, if we decide apples are oranges and everybody now calls apples oranges, it's fine because we know what we're talking about. Yes. But if they all talk, talk of them as pears and blackberries and other things, then nobody knows what the hell There's they are. nothing in common, absolutely. Got you. Yeah, and hence why I think it's so important that we start to actually... Uh, it doesn't matter what... If we want to call apples oranges, that's fine. It's not a problem. Mm. So long as we understand what we're talking about. Uh, yeah. I.e., we have a common understanding of what words we use to mean what. So understand... The word understand, people are saying it means stand under. Mm. So why, doesn't, why, why, why do they use the word understand then? If well, you implied, know, the answer is that it's there to fool you so that you are contracting with them secretly. <laughs> well, again, if you follow the rationality, for a contract to be valid in law, there must be a meeting of minds. Right. So if you, on one hand, believe the word means or implying that it's stand under, but you express it as understand, that the interpretation of that contract would be a normal person leaving school mm. to them. So, so, yeah, no, I absolutely get it. So if so, talking just br briefly, because I know you've got your 15 mm. minute thing, um, another one that, uh, of course, is uh, very big seems to be if somebody says it comes up to you and they might be a bailiff or they might be a, a policeman or they might be yeah. somebody of authority and they say oh are you richard vobes and you go yes you've contracted again that they're under your you're now under their jurisdiction because you answered to a name well again what are the terms and conditions that you've had a meeting of the minds to right all you've admitted is yeah, I'm Richard Vogues, and what's it got to do with you? Yeah. Or you. So basically, again, if I just quickly explain what's going on in the courts uh, uh, in regards to trust, people have this view that there's a Sester KV trust in this, that, and the other. Um, yes, there is a trust. A trust very simply is where there's an exchange of promises which are not instantly uh, fulfilled. So the claim, okay, is granted to the court that there is the trust property. The judge and the officers of the court are the trustees of that property. They have to follow the rules of the trust, i.e. the rules of the court and the law, 
to determine who is the beneficiary of that claim. That's your trust. So when you go, when you when you are in in the court and you're yeah. saying that, that they are the the public trustees, yeah. um, then there can only be two other roles. Correct. In there, and the beneficiary presumably is you. Unless oh you no, give no, away... no! The beneficiary is, you know, who, uh, you know, if the if I put in a claim. Mm. that you owe me a thousand pounds that's the trust property which has been entrusted to the officers of the court to determine if you owe me a hundred pounds or if you don't owe me a hundred pounds i.e right. who's the beneficiary of the claim so the beneficiary so can be you are innocent or you have an obligation to fulfill right okay so you can't claim, or can you claim that you are the executor of this trust and that the public uh, trustees are the judges and you're the beneficiary? Uh, no, all you've got is two people arguing about who's the beneficiary of the claim. Right. The trustee is the officers of the court. The trust property has been granted by the claimant, but the claimant may not have a valid claim, and he's saying you are the uh, liable party and he's the beneficiary of the claim. Right. Whereas so to... you are saying, no, show me the obligation. And if you can't show me the obligation, your claim is worth zero. And, and that's for the trustee, the officers of the court to determine, uh, is the claim valid? And if it is valid, then the claimant is the beneficiary. If it's not valid, it's got a zero value. It's worth nothing and hence gets thrown out. Just before we just yeah. to lead on to one other thing, if yeah. I can ask no, you this. Fine. That's fine. Um, I've been pointed to by many people the 12 presumptions of law, one of which is presuming that unless well they all say unless you rebut this this is the status or the, yeah. the situation and one of those is it's it's assumed that you are the trustee unless you rebut that the judge is the trustee you fighting about um are you the liable party to the beneficiary the the alleged beneficiary the claimant believes he's the beneficiary or they the beneficiary yes uh, and you're just fighting whether you are the liable party to the beneficiary of the claim. Right. The claim is the trust property. Yeah. So I suppose in olden days, you've got the beautiful princess and it's two princes fighting to who's going to claim the princess. Yeah. And somebody is just judging. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So who, right. the judge is the trustee to determine who has the higher rights basically, right. to the princess. Yes. Yeah. Your, your trust, your trusting is going to do a good job as well. <laughs> no, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You, you are trusting, hence the verb. Yes. The the trust is the, the trust property, the officers of the court as trustees, the grantor of the claim. Okay. And uh, that there is the noun of the trust, and the verb is. Both parties, the, the arguing kiddies, uh, are trusting that the trustee will do his job according to the rules of the game, the trust law. Right. So, yeah. OK, good. Well, <laughs> cleared up another little uh, thing. So, yes, you're, go, go on with the... Um, yeah, what I want to do is just basically to give some people an idea of trying to start to talk. It doesn't matter what word we agree on. Again, this is not about being right. So long as mm. we can agree, we're talking about the same things. Right. That's what's important. And to me, it seems stupid to reinvent another language because that's what many people are claiming the judiciary are doing. So why don't we just simply understand their language uh, because really it's the same thing. So I'll just quickly uh, share my screen again. H how long have we got, Richard, just to give me some Yeah, we've got 15 minutes. 
Okay. Okay, so this year is, uh, maybe I can uh, do a whole screen. Uh, oh no, that goes on to two. Okay, I'll just keep it as big as possible here. So what I want to do is just quickly go through history a bit mm. so that we can see where terminology comes, you know, terms that are being used uh, and uh, understand really what is uh, what is called uh, the uh, constitutional principles, i.e., what are the fundamental principles which uh, set out the relationship between those governing and the governed? Mm. Because this is what creates the duties to uh, to us. So basically, natural law. I put down laws of creation, whatever people want to call it, God's law, Allah's law, yeah, you know, whatever. That's between them and their creator. I, but essentially, it's a law which is we have no control over, but we can discover. Yes. Okay. Then what happened was in 1066, there was a change. That change was the Norman invasion, uh, which introduced the legal system called star decisis. So that there is a historic change in, in, in uh, the course of running the country, the relationship between the governed and the governs. And basically, Blackstone calls anything before 1066 old common law. Uh, uh, Cope calls it ancient common law. And that's what they're talking about when they're talking about custom. Basically, a custom is anything pre-1066. And what happened there? Star decisis was introduced as the legal system and it addressed the thing of certainty and consistency in the law. What star decisis is, is that lower courts are bound by higher court decisions and that courts at the same level are bound by their decisions, i.e. all are equal under the law and no one is above the law. That is the constitutional principle established in 1066. Um, then uh, rationality was uh, introduced in 1610, which we'll come on to. The next major change, okay, was Magna Carta 1215. Mm. Now, you'll hear a lot of people talking about Magna Carta 1215, um, and to me, I'm a bit, uh, you know, uh, brush it aside, other than of what is important about Magna Carta 1215. It established the, con uh, it's a very important constitutional document. What happened there was of constitutional importance, being that the governed are subject to the rule of law, i.e. the king subject themselves to the law. Massive change. Further, constitutionally, all dispute settlement was trial by jury at no cost. That there addresses the issue of equality of arms. Basically, right. you've got this monster state to try and stop it railroading the individual. They have to provide you a neutral um, venue to resolve dispute. And it should be at no cost, i.e. they can't force you out of your rights because you cannot afford uh, justice. This is a serious problem in our civil system today because big corporations just threaten the little guy with the uh, potential of stupid costs where it becomes an economic decision and it's not no longer about right or wrong. It's about, shit, if I lose this, I'm going to be bankrupt. Mm. Justice is fundamental to society. If we want to live in peace, we need a, a fair justice system. Money has no value unless there is the rule of law. 
the other is a constitutional principle established in Magna Carta was no taxation without representation. Okay. Now, that there is really a separate topic on its own, which was addressed in the last video. There cannot be a unilateral imposition of somebody's will on any other. Therefore, consent is required. This thing of representation is a, a misnomer. It's a political solution. However, in law, it is clear. Nobody can impose their will on another. And this is part of the problem we have. The well, I was courts, going to say, and yet they do. <laughs> the courts are being used to uphold politics. Right. That there's a breach of the rule of law, the constitutional principle of the rule of law, and it's a breach of the constitutional principle of the separation of powers, which we'll be coming on to. So the problem is the judiciary is playing politics. That's a breach of the independence of the judiciary, a breach of their duty by only doing, fulfilling their statutory obligation as opposed to their obligation to us, the people, which is according to law. So that's where the problem lies. It's the courts not knowing what their job is uh, and us not holding them to account to do their job. Right, yeah. So again, this is what I'm saying. Once we understand the problem, we can start to focus the energy. That's where it yes. really will start to happen. Um, there's a convention basically at 1225. That's when uh, English statutes start with Magna Carta 1225, i.e. before 1225, definitely it's, a, it's customary. Okay. But mm. since uh, 1225, Magna Carta 1225, onwards is where statute law as they call it now um, it, it was created 1297 the confirmation of the charters defines the word law of the land as common law as it was expressed in the great charter magna carta 1297 so here we've got a definition of common law which is accepted by parliament so why do we want to fight this Mm -hmm. Let's use the words they use. So whenever they refer to law of the land, what they're talking about is common law. Right. So the constitutional principle and significance of this, again, is of a confirmation of the charters and Magna Carta 1297, is the rule of law is supreme over governance, which is subject to the common law. So now we're starting to see a hierarchy of how this should be working. Uh, all are equal under the law, nobody's above the law, is common law, and common law must be upheld by those governing, i.e. parliament, the government, as well as the courts. Um, the word time immemorial, uh, you'll hear referred to, and basically that was defined in 1832 to mean pre-1377. So anything before 1377, if somebody talks about time immemorial, that's what they're talking about. But from what we've seen there, there's in essence a 311 year overlap from 1066 mm. up to uh, 1377. But really, that's inconsequential when we see what comes afterwards. Right. In 1610 was a great constitutional case which was very much relied on in the Boris Johnson judgment in 2019 when he wanted to prorogue Parliament. However, again, there's an error in there, and I'm quite happy to take this up with the, uh, the law lords, okay, because this actually was settled in 1610. That was a resolution between the king and the uh, all of his uh, councils and that uh, and the judiciary at the time so they resolve prerogative powers are subject to the common law i.e it's the common law the law created by the people which give the authority to govern through royal prerogative and 
the, the question at the time was, if there is no precedent, a precedent needs to be set, i.e. some law needs to be created for a new novel uh, situation. Mm. And basically it was resolved, proper consideration must be made. That there today we call the precautionary principle. Further, it was resolved, there must be rational reasoning. And it must comply with the existing principles of the common law. I.e., any new uh, uh, um, legislation must be rational, it must follow the precautionary principle, and it must comply with the common law. So this gives us a hierarchy of law. Common law stands above statute law. Mm. However, we've got custom, and this was agreed, the word law at the time meant custom, or common law, or statute law, i.e. all three of those were law. But because the statute law is created through prerogative powers, it is subject to the common law. That means statute law must be lower authority than common law. It must comply with the common law. Right. So we've got a hierarchy clearly rationally established in 1610. And that rebuts this nonsense that Parliament is supreme creator of law. Yes. Another obvious reason that that's nonsense. And in Halsbury's Laws of England, it actually says that this is merely a theory. <laughs> it's a belief. The evidence, though, and rationality says that belief is wrong. And we know that Parliament cannot even create an act of Parliament. All that Parliament can do is propose a bill for enactment by the monarch. So Parliament is not supreme creator of law. So the constitutional principle really was that when we make, when Parliament creates a new enactment to set a precedent which is not present in the common law, it must adhere to rational reasoning. So, so Parliament has a job before they put forward an act of Parliament to the monarch for enacting, they must make sure that it's lawful. They don't. Mm. There's one major problem with what's not happening. Parliament is failing in its duty. Then in 1615, basically, the Earl of Oxford case uh, ruled that the rules of equity prevail over the common law, i.e. equity is supreme over common law in the event of a conflict. So now we're starting to see even more clearly the hierarchy of law. Equity prevails over common law, which prevails over statute law in the event of a conflict. Equity essentially is your conscience, which distinguishes right from wrong. It's right. you knowing what is fair and just. Yes. Okay. So the constitutional principle established then in 1615, hence is all governance must be based upon the rules of law and the rule of law is conscience. What is right and wrong and what is fair and just. Blimey. Then the Bill of Rights, that there is the source of authority of those governing today. Parliament makes this claim. It can unenact what it enacted. One parliament cannot bind another parliament. That is utter nonsense. The Bill of Rights is what gives Parliament its legal authority. If they were to unenact that, they remove their own authority. Oh, yes. However, so they what's they important do. about the Bill of Rights, okay, it creates and reaffirms the constitutional principle that primary is the rule of law and that is supreme over the separation of powers. Then we move on to 1700, the Act of Settlement. 
that actually defines what law is. So going back to their oath affirmations or attestations, the judicial oath is to law, and law is defined as your birthright, and your birthright is your ancient right and liberty in the Bill of Rights, which is the rule of law is conscience, therefore law equals conscience, equity. So that, and further, the constitutional principle in the Act of Settlement was it reinforced the rule of law and the absolute independence of the judiciary. So basically, the rights of monarchs to govern is vested in prerogative. That is exercised through the crown. Now, the crown is a corporation sole or aggregate, i.e. it's not a body corporate, and the reason for that is body corporates are created through legislation. It's a legal personality. This year was before there was authority. Therefore, legal sovereignty is expressed in the monarch through each of the powers, i.e. the crown in parliament, his majesty's government, and his majesty's court and tribunal services. Therefore, the monarch is supreme. However, the monarch, the royal prerogative, plus the actions of parliament, the government, and the courts are all subject to the rule of law, which is equity. So, uh, royal assent is a prerogative power, and that was last used in 1708. And in 1914, George V was going to use it, but the government persuaded him not to. Therefore, in 1610, it was admitted, royal prerogative is subject to the common law, the law of the land. Therefore, all governance is subject to the common law. And the common law is equity. Now, in, 16, uh, in 1967, in the Royal Assent Act, Parliament itself left the royal prerogative of enactment with the monarch. Royal prerogative is granted by what's called convention, but convention isn't legally binding. Basically, it's a, a safety valve that the monarch has as head trustee to govern the people according to law. He can enact that anytime he likes without any uh, uh, legal redress. So basically, the definitions which I'm proposing are these. If we can start talking the same language, then at least we really can start to focus the light. So right. basically, pre-1066, custom or customary common law. Post-1066, common law is the law of the land. The constitutional principle established in 1066 are all are equal under the law, nobody is above the law. In 1215, added to that is governance is subject to the rule of law, free public dis dispute resolution by trial by jury, and no taxation without representation. 1297, governance is subject to the common law. In six, post 1610 though, Common law includes reasoned decisions, that there's precedent. So when people are talking about the rules of common law, that's what's important. What formula did we use to determine a case? So it's not the uh, judgment itself, but the reasoned uh, decision. How did logic and reason lead to that conclusion of the judgment? In 1610, the rule of law uh, included rationality and the precautionary principle. 1615, it includes equity. Um, and hence, post-1688, it includes ancient rights and liberties. And therefore, uh, the law... Whoops, that should be 1688, not 1288. Uh, the rule of law is supreme over the separation of powers 
and post-1700, basically, law means your birthright, which means you have the right to common law, and that means the rules of equity prevail, and law means uh, that the courts must uphold what is fair and just, and do what is right and wrong. Once we understand this, then we can start to attack the problem. The judiciary is not doing its job. They are breaching their oath. And therefore, we can start seeing these buggers. And that's what the Leighton Judgment's all about. So when it comes to council tax, Oops, which is... Muted. Oh, no, I... Maybe my speaker just went off. Sorry, Richard. Oh, sorry. Um, so when it comes to things like council tax, which is vexing people at the moment... Um, because it is seen to be unfair Correct. for for various reasons, which we need to go into. Um, and people are being given liability orders and then a bunch of thugs come around with threats and menaces and yeah. what have you. Um, and people are going, well, if that's a bit of legislation, then are we duty bound to pay that come what may? No, you're not. The um, Ashby... That's all you needed to say, by the way. Yeah, the Ashby <laughs> versus White... Uh, judgment in 1703 made it absolutely clear you are not bound by anything unless you consent right okay so th there's no lawful obligation which is what we established uh, when we started the knock knock that's the whole knock knock challenge there is no lawful obligation why because nobody can evidence the right to impose their will upon another in law in law however they are trying to force the courts are making and upholding political decisions i have no issue about governance so long as it's lawful right there are many ways that you can finance the services which are lawful for instance the community can authorize the creation of money for the people which are providing for the community, which they can trade into the private sector, as opposed to borrowing from a, a, a monopoly uh, for the benefit of a few. Yes. So which... there are many solutions. What I'm saying is humanity has the ability to work it out for themselves. And I'm saying... It must be lawful. Yes, as opposed to awful, which is as opposed to awful. Actually, that's a nice one, Richard. Yeah, which is which is where we are putting fear um, and uh, and people. I mean, somebody told me the story this morning, and it, again, it's hearsay. But uh, somebody told me the story that a young chap was given a liability order. He felt so bad he committed suicide. Absolutely, which is yeah. absolutely appalling. It's absolutely, and, and the magistrates are. Uh, okay, we we now it's interesting now that we're starting to express ourselves more accurately when we're going into the courts. Okay, now the magistrates are basically turning around to the legal advisors and saying, "Can you please repeat your advice?" Really? Okay, we are getting through to the magistrates. They realise. OK, that is good news. And with district judges, they are turning around and saying, I am statutorily obliged to grant the liability order. OK, because their oath, their duty is not only a statutory duty. That's only one part of their job. Right. Statutes are administrative law how they're going to govern us according to the first promise that Charles made, according to our respective laws and customs. Everywhere you look, governance is subject to us. However, we've forgotten how to hold them to account. Yes, they need our consent. Absolutely, because nobody can impose their will on another. So basically, what are they breaching? They're breaching their own legislation, theft act, uh, modern slavery acts, uh, fraud act, 
you know, they're breaching their own legislation. Uh, well, sorry. No, the, I, no, I'm I, I just aware that we've gone over the the uh, sort of yeah, hour. But it's no, 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 not at all, because it's absolutely fascinating, and you've you've crystallised this in a, in a very um, um, crystallized way. I can't think of the words. Um, <laughs> which which it, which is really good, and I hope that people do take note of this because if it comes down to as you say, with laser focus, that we can oh, focus on in the a fact year, that in a year they, they, finished. Yes, then then it can be over. Yeah. Uh, and all the harm that is going on in the courts to people. Yeah. Um, mostly, it sounds like that, that a lot of, in in terms of the council tax, that the magistrates just haven't a clue. They've got one part of the story, but they've they've actually exactly. forgotten. And, that, and uh, the government's got very tight control over what goes on in the magistrates' court. In essence, we've got three legal systems here. Yes. We've got a civil system which works reasonably well. However, there's the uh, inequality of arms. Basically, in civil cases, they threaten you with money, uh, threats of costs, and people end up just making an economic decision as opposed to the foundational rule of law which mm. is why in 1290, uh, 1215 already that was understood. We've forgotten yeah. that lesson. Yes. The law should be free to everybody. Um, and so that's one system, but it works reasonably well. Uh, it's just the big corporate bullies that get away with it. Yes. The other system is where there's actual harm caused uh, to another person. Which is, which is where in the Crown Court they'll do a trial by jury. However, the third system and the reason they are not applying the civil procedure rules in the magistrates' courts, the civil procedure rules in the magistrates' courts will stop this because uh, they, they are a good set of rules, but then they would not be able to screw over their revenue collections courts and that is what they're using the civil uh, courts, the magistrates courts, civil jurisdiction as a administrative court to give the illusion of the rule of law to ensure the government revenues keeps flowing. And by golly, that really does happen. 90-95% of the cases are magistrates court cases. Mark, it's been a joy to catch up with you after uh, quite some time. Um, I, I hope the audience has bear with me on the little extension of today's video, but it's been absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be some interesting comments. Yeah, no, that's... Any, but, uh, that, that, you know, they're it, all welcome. It, it, it's definitely going to prod, and this is what we're finding. The more we focusing in on the, on, uh, the, the truth, uh, we're hitting a lot of egos. Mm. and people are reacting but that's well it's, it's it's the egos we're so desperate need to just be played down for a while whilst we sort the problem once, once we're back in the light you can dance about oh, and be the oh, you know be the peacock yeah. at the party but until then let's all pull together uh, the truth will pull us together brilliant Definitely. yeah and, and yes. it really is happening you can see it happening richard that's that's good news. You are peacemakers.org.uk, Mark Hall. Peacekeepers. Be, sorry, peacekeepers. Peacekeepers. Yes, I'm, I, I, really, I wrote it down. I just read it. <laughs> uh, peacekeepers. I'm sure you're making a lot of peace as well, but uh, you are peacekeepers.org.uk. I'll put the link in the description, of course. Right. Do check Thanks, out the videos. Uh, which they are highly entertaining and full of lots of uh, good advice. You're 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 um, breaking new ground all the time, which is which is yeah. superb. And um, I forget where you, you're sort of somewhere up north somewhere, aren't you? Liverpool. Liverpool. There we are. We and, were and we've to got be in... two interesting cases coming up here to test uh, this into the courts to force it into the higher courts. It needs... Oh, brilliant. Well, the best of, you probably don't need the luck because uh, I'm sure you're there, but I'll give you my my uh, good vibes we will, from We will want people because we need those courts full. Full, yeah, absolutely. Well, check out, all the news will be on your website, so yeah. do check that out. Great. Mark, been a joy to talk to you. Thanks, I'll let you, let you get on. Uh, there you are, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've got something from that. I'll be back with more monologues and wonderful interviews. But until then, from Mark and I, thanks for watching. Goodbye.